All right, 1999. This is another weird one. Not so much because of the contents of the pasta itself, but because of some of the absolutely crazy bullshit surrounding its distribution and the legitimacy of some of its content. To ease you all into this, 1999 is less of a lost episode pasta and more of a lost channel pasta, which I honestly think is a better concept. It's way more like Candle Cove in nature, and you guys know I love that story. Even then, something I like about this story is that it's way less of a story describing the lost media in detail, as if that's supposed to be the spooky part, and more of a detective story due to the origins of the media itself. You know, that thing a lot of lost episode stories just kind of gloss over? Who mutilated these children in gruesome ways? I don't know, that's gonna get less coverage in this story than Squidward being sad and hearing wind. Okay, story's over, bye. This is a story that seems to be made as almost a direct response to a lot of lost episode creepypastas and the cliches they've spawned. It was pretty refreshing to read a lost episode style pasta that wasn't complete garbage, and yet apparently creepypasta fans weren't totally happy with reading something that wasn't trash, and decided to have their own go at making it so. Or maybe they didn't? Look, it's a shit show. For now, we're going to be looking at the story as you can read it now. So let's get started. Now we've only got two real characters to talk about. Our main character, Elliot, and the star of the Lost Channel, Mr. Bear. I gotta say, I like Elliot. His demeanor is very refreshing to read as far as creepypasta protagonists go. Despite the traumatic events he's been through, it's only until later in the story when shit really starts to hit him that he becomes a bit more gloomy. And even then, he never strays too far into the realm of melodrama, and even casually pokes fun at himself for when he does so. You get the sense that this really is some guy's blog talking about something interesting that happened to him, but you don't get too much padding, which is something I was worried about going into this story. It's a little heavy-handed when he telegraphs that the events that took place in 1999 were disturbing, when there's not really any build-up to that fact yet, but it's not too bad. He works well as the protagonist of this kind of story. Not only was he present to watch the shows described rather than simply being an omnipotent narrator or laying what is essentially an urban legend or rumor, he's involved in the disturbing events as well. Or at least he came very close to being involved. He's akin to Jay from Marble Hornets in that he plays detective for a good part of his story, and it makes sense as to why this channel is something he'd want to investigate in the first place considering his immense personal connection to it. This is by no means groundbreaking, but it's definitely refreshing, and by having a character whose motivations make sense, we're more easily able to ease ourselves into the lost media content without having to worry about why the main character would even bother telling us about this or worrying about plot holes. And of course, we have our antagonist through this whole thing, known only as Mr. Bear. I too know a Mr. Bear, but he lives on my head. He tells me things. Things about forest fires. Anyway, Mr. Bear isn't the strongest antagonistic character, both literally in terms of what he's capable of and in terms of writing. He has no super-powered abilities, unlike many creepypasta bad guys, and unlike my own Mr. Bear, who has the power of smoke generation and manipulation. This is something I'm fine with, as he's fairly intimidating on his own without any powers. His motivations are laid out fairly early on in a show called Paint with the Soul, where he picks up a bunch of trash in the woods and says that people are trash and he wants to get rid of them. There also isn't really a mystery to what he does, so it's not like there's a big twist at the end where all is revealed. We know what he does from an early point, so it's more like a lot of the story is getting to the point where we see the tape of him killing a bunch of kids. What Mr. Barrel lacks in depth, he makes up for in presentation and intimidation. His shows are disturbing, and using them as a means of luring children into his cellar only to dispose of them is not too far from the realm of reality, making him feel surprisingly grounded. The fact that he's never caught also creates this nagging feeling that he's still out there somewhere and might be coming after Elliot. So Mr. Bear is a functional antagonist, and works as a means to get not only the investigation angle going for Elliot, but also as a means of getting us to the lost media itself. Often in lost episode pastas, the big question at the end of the day is, what's the point? Why even bother making this convoluted episode of Spongebob or Ed, Ed and Eddie with weird imagery and spooky shit happening? Is it just to scare the hell out of kids? It certainly doesn't work on the fucking audience. 
Oh no, SpongeBob is turning into a zombified ghoul, and Double D is becoming blurry! Well, for starters, Mr. Bear's shows are actually sinister. In fact, I'd say my biggest issue with them is they start off too sinister for their intended purpose, which is to lure children into a cellar to be a part of his shows and eventually killed off in what seems to be some sort of satanic ritual. This alone gives the lost media in question leagues more narrative purpose than almost any other lost episode pasta in existence, and that's pretty important considering they're often the focal point of the story. I do think the motivation is fairly weak, but at the very least, it's believable. The guy is a serial killer, and the reason for killing people doesn't really have to be really well thought out, and the method makes it interesting enough to keep reading. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that you can just have your killer character do whatever you need them to do for the sake of the story because they're crazy, because that would be complete dog shit writing. <clears throat> Back on the subject of the shows, we're not given all that many of them, which is surprising for a pasta this length. With the whole thing basically being a lost channel story, you'd think it would be the focus, but it really isn't. They're more used to give context to the events that took place in 1999 in order to give us more to work off of from a detective angle, rather than being the sole focus and primary source of scares. Some of them are more meant to be kind of off-putting and just sort of out there as opposed to being outright scary, which is a touch I appreciate. I think what I would have liked to see more of are episodes where things are like 80% okay, but there's a sinister vibe about the whole thing, or just one or two things that seem off. The first episode of Mr. Bear's Cellar comes close to this, but it's not quite innocent enough to sell me on the idea of this guy using his kids show to lure in kids. I feel like too many would get scared off like our narrator almost was. I would've. Hell, when I was a kid, I was scared off by Are You Afraid of the Dark? Mr. Bear's Cellar would've left me fucking traumatized. More than I already was. Look at this! Look at this! They showed this to kids! Okay, let's get through the story before we get to talking about the controversial aspects. Our story begins with our main character, Elliot, reminiscing about the bizarre summer of 1999, and all he wants to do is watch some fucking Pokemon. He misses an episode a day because his dad is too busy watching Fox News broadcasts of 4chan blowing up car bombs and closing pools due to AIDS. His dad gets sick of this twerp asking about his dumb Pokemon show and gets him his own TV to shut him up, even if it doesn't even have the channel Pokemon is on. Jokes aside, not a bad setup to introduce the foreign element of the lost channel. Once he has his own TV, he flips through the channels and finds Channel 21, a public access channel that's only picked up by older TVs with rabbit ears, which features poorly made, low-budget children's shows. And definitely some Candle Cove vibes here, but the story's identity is unique enough to pull it off without feeling like a ripoff. It's definitely its own thing. This next part of the story is Elliot describing a few episodes that he remembers in detail. Mr. Bear's Cellar is a show about a guy in a bear costume who basically plays around with a new kid every episode. The first episode is certainly weird and there's a few red flags, but it's nothing major. It's a good start. Soup and Spoon is this bizarre special where a spoon chases a can of soup around and then a bunch of kids sit around a table about to eat the soup. I like that the kids seem confused, like even they have no idea what's going on here. The next episode of Mr. Bear Cellar he sees is a bit stranger, with an older child trying to get his sister away from Mr. Bear and attempting to run away. This, to me, is too much too fast for how much of the story is left, but as far as the timeline is concerned, this is nearing the time when Mr. Bear will kill all the kids, so it's not like it's a plot hole or anything, I just think we needed a bit of build-up to get to this point. The next episode is a straight-up invitation to come to the cellar. Just send in a letter and be part of the show. Elliot actually does so, and his dad is actually cool with all this. I think this part's a bit odd considering how he doesn't seem to want to watch much more of the channel. He only seems to do so when he's bored lately. But he does so anyway and heads to Mr. Bear's house, only to discover that the police are there, having just discovered a major crime scene that Elliot's dad refuses to tell him about. Elliot's dad just gets them both the hell out of there and doesn't say anything about what happened until years later when he turns 13. Mr. Bear ran the shows on Channel 21 from his cellar in order to lure kids in where he then kidnapped them. The author dangles what actually happened in front of us constantly here without actually giving any good information and it honestly gets kind of annoying. 
Considering this is supposed to be a blog, you'd think the people reading it would get pretty sick of these long wait times only to get obvious information instead of the important details. And it doesn't feel particularly natural. He has no reason to hold this information back. He does so in the next update with no issues. It's almost like he was under the impression that people wouldn't be interested in what happened, or like he just didn't feel like saying it until prompted. In this blog post, he says that 16 kids were found burned in a deep ditch in the forest. Again, the ultimate goal here of just killing a bunch of kids for the glory of Satan is kind of weak, but it could definitely be a lot worse. Maybe it's because it feels fairly disconnected from the whole Lost Channel setup. If it was more closely related, I might have ended up a bit more satisfied. He does some digging with someone he's not super familiar with, who used to live not too far away from the Bear Residence. This guy would see a dude going into the forest with a whole bunch of kids just sitting around a campfire singing their campfire song. But crime rates are low, since this isn't America, so he doesn't suspect much and tells them to keep it down. They don't. Anyway, Elliot talks to his dad's friend, who's a cop, and heads down to the police station to look at some tapes they found in the house after investigating. All the tapes they have are split up between different police stations for some reason. This seems like video game logic to me. All the pages of the Thievius Raccoonus are split up, so we have to go to all the different locations to get them back. Anyway, the first of the tapes he sees is an episode of the show called Paint with the Soul. Anyone who's here for the controversy knows this one well, so don't worry, we're gonna get to that. This is a show that was mentioned previously, along with another show where a guy in a chair talks about appeasing Satan. Basically, this one's some guy walking through the woods at sundown, picking up a bunch of trash and showing it to the camera, talking about how humans are garbage and he would save ourselves from ourselves by cleaning up the garbage that is ourselves. These two things I just mentioned are basically the motivation we're getting for our killer. It's nothing amazing, but at least the presentation of being in video form makes it fairly unique. The next tape is another episode of Mr. Bear's Cellar, where Mr. Bear basically spikes a bunch of glasses of orange juice before giving them to the 16 kids who would later be found dead in the fire pit, including the kid from earlier who tried to get away. He sings a little song, everyone chugs their orange juice, and the episode ends as Elliot leaves the station to look for more answers. After a while, Elliot visits the old Mr. Bear house. He looks around for a while before deciding to head off towards the woods where all the horrible shit happened. He has a standoff with some teenagers there where the dialogue honestly isn't that great, and it seems like he's trying to make himself seem like a total badass, and I'm just not feeling it. It kind of gives me Jeff the Killer vibes when he's trying to fight off the bullies. He asks if they know about what happened here, and they do, saying that Mr. Bear now lives in a nearby storm drain. He leaves the kids to play around in their fort and heads back, making note of the storm drain for next time, and admits that without any more tapes to watch, he's kind of out of leads and things to talk about. That's probably why this part of the story feels like a bit of a drag. It's realistic that he's not getting breaks in the case all the time, but at the same time, we just get these sort of nothing entries. Though this one has more to it than meets the eye, but we'll get there. The next entry is quite a while later. He went to the storm drain but found nothing worth noting, and with the trail having basically gone cold, just forgot about the blog for a while until an email showed up from Mr. Bear, or someone posing as him. It really seems to be an email talking about the credibility of Elliot's story more than anything else, and it's written in poor English, though this is clearly intentional. Elliot even seems to make note of how badly it's written, and comes to the conclusion that this is a fake email just sent to scare him. He sends a reply for shits and giggles, and vows to continue his investigation. He's in less high spirits the next time we talk to him. The email has been deleted and led nowhere. In fact, he's had to change his email because so many people are now pretending to be Mr. Bear and sending him fake messages. I actually like this detail because this is totally something that would happen. Especially if he highlighted the last one on his blog, people would do it some more for attention. Anyway, he's updating again because his dad's cop friend found the new tape, so now he's off to go see it. Once he sees the tape, he gives us another update, and he's not feeling too great about what he's seen. The tape consists of Mr. Bear taking the kids one by one and sticking them in a hole in the ground while they're unconscious from the spiked orange juice before focusing on some canisters of gasoline, obviously to be used next before the episode ends. It also turns out there's another tape of the actual burning process that Elliot is really not sure if he wants to see. A detail I can appreciate, as this is already pretty heavy as it stands, but there's really nothing to be gained from watching something so traumatizing. 
The next entry is obviously not from Elliot himself, instead being written as a story about him from the perspective of Mr. Bear being bookended by the phrase INRI, an initialism referring to Jesus. This seems to imply some kind of religious motivation behind the killings, and the Satanist show I mentioned earlier called The Fallen Angel in Life has someone talking to the camera about how we must please Satan. But that's the only real previous connection. After the sinister hacked message is posted, it takes Elliot several months to update again. And once he comes back, he says that he's watched the last tape. He admits to not really knowing why he wanted to see it, except maybe out of a sense of closure. He thinks he'll be fine watching it because he's watched every Saw film and a video of animal slaughterhouses. At least he admits he was being really naive, because nothing really prepares you for seeing videos of even adults dying, let alone a whole group of kids. The description is far more reserved than what you'd expect for this kind of story, which is very refreshing. It doesn't go into too much graphic detail, and the description is more how he's feeling while watching it. Once the burning is done, it cuts to the Mr. Bear outfit lying on the ground in the shape of a cross. And near the suit is a sign reading INRI, with a final zoom on the bear suit's face. And with that, the episode comes to an end. Elliot, however, doesn't seem to take note of this because he's too shocked by the ordeal he's gone through, and he mentions that watching the tape didn't help him at all. All it's done is give him nightmares that it's taken a while to get over. He mentions how the hacked message was sent on Halloween and has kept it up simply to show the readers. What still goes unmentioned is the use of INRI in both the message and the final tape, something that only Mr. Bear himself or the police officers who have the tape could have known about before Elliot posted this blog post. Based on Mr. Bear's previously seen terrible use of the English language, I think it's safe to assume that it's still Elliot making this blog post, but he's clearly not safe even if he thinks he is. He mentions that he's going to try and contact his dad's friend again to see the other tapes, and the story simply ends. It's a very Ted the Caver style ending where we're only left to assume that something terrible must have happened to him off screen. It also reminds me a bit of the ending to Ben Drowned, where there's a small clue in the story that tells you what really happened, but it's not spelled out for you. So it's kind of a mix between Ben Drowned and Ted the Caver's ending. It feels realistic, but still very sudden and unsatisfying. We don't have enough information to put the pieces together ourselves as to who Mr. Bear could be, where he is now, and what he might have done to Elliot. But regardless, this is the ending we got. Or is it? Okay, so a few of you who have read the story in the past when it was on the Creepypasta wiki are probably scratching your heads right now thinking, wait a second, that's not where it ended. There were other entries, and what happened to Booby and those other episodes of Paint with a Soul? And the rest of you who only know about the version I just described to you are now asking, who the fuck is Booby? Isn't it like a bird or something? Well, let's go back a ways. This story first became famous on the Creepypasta wiki, as most other pastas did, and it was credited to a user named Giant Engineer. However, the version that was posted to the wiki was not the same version I just described to you. It was mostly the same, but contained entirely new episodes of previously mentioned shows, and even a new show altogether. The new show that is not present in the version you can read today was called Booby. It was basically this hand puppet show minus the puppets. It's clearly meant to be a parody of the old kids TV show Ubi, although Ubi first aired in 2000 while Booby is mentioned as being played in 1999 obviously. So I suppose it's more of a meta parody as opposed to in-universe. There's a few new episodes of Paint with a Soul as well, but they seem very different from the one we saw. And most importantly, there was an entirely new entry taking place two months after the last one. On first glance, this entry is really nothing special, and it really seems more like filler than anything else. Elliot sees another tape with the two shows mentioned, including the booby episode, where a man is beaten to death with a baseball bat. Elliot even seems to mention that it was all basically pointless and he got nowhere. He even emailed the person who sent the hacked message, but only got INRI as a response. He says he's going to keep searching, and then the story actually ends. Okay, so about that Paint with the Soul episode. Those of you familiar with a YouTube series called Alan Tutorial might recognize, well, the entire thing. This entry is ripped off almost wholesale from an Alan Tutorial video. And if you look back at the other Paint with the Soul episode that was missing from the current version, it also gives off a massive Alan Tutorial vibe. It's hard to believe this is apparently the same show as the guy walking through the woods picking up trash. 
Word of this got out fast, and even the creepypasta wiki acknowledged that the story was likely plagiarizing Alan's tutorial. But then, in a completely unprecedented turn of events, the original author comes out saying that the version of 1999 on the creepypasta wiki is indeed plagiarized, off of his own work. See, according to the original author, who goes by Camden Lamond, Giant Engineer stole his story, uploaded it to the Creepypasta wiki without his knowledge, and added a bunch of shit, including Booby, the other episode of Paint with the Soul, and the final entry. All of the dates of the story were also changed completely for some reason. I'm not entirely sure why. So Camden systematically went through and copyright claimed almost every reading of 1999 that was based on the plagiarized version on YouTube, and that version is now very difficult to find. I was able to find it on three places, two of them my fans sent me. The last two thirds of the story can be found on this random Japanese website, which graciously highlights the changes made between each version. Another is the full story listed on Wattpad, which covers the missing beginning, but can't be copy-pasted, so I had to write down the missing parts manually. The last place I found was the undercooked analysis reading, and these guys were among the first to recognize the Alan tutorial plagiarism. The cameraman made his way through the alley, the derelict buildings on one side, and rusted metal fence on the other. Oh my god, no, this is mother... Okay, no, he knows about... This is, this is, straight, up, this is straight up Alan tutorial. Man, this is... <laughs> yeah, this is straight up... This is almost par this is this parody? I don't know. That's weird. What? For real? <laughs> okay, so Let, let's let's keep going. Okay, let's... no. Okay, we need to stop for a second. <laughs> Cuz okay. It's oh weird. my god. This does this mean our the story's integrity has just taken a nosedive? Let's Now Slime Beast, who you'll know is the author of Abandoned by Disney, Funny Mouth, and of course I Hate You, did his own digging and he thinks this is all bullshit. According to him, Camden is lying and just covering his tracks to hide the fact that he plagiarized Alan tutorial, and his efforts to remove the original reading from YouTube are another means of ensuring his tracks are covered. So, what is the deal? Was Camden the victim of having his original story stolen, or is he a liar who's just trying to save face? I conducted my own investigation using the tools I had, so let's take a look at whatever evidence I managed to find and see what conclusion we can come to. Let's go. First things first, let's take a look at Slime V's latest video talking about 1999 and his take on the situation. Let's start off with something that's easily disproven, that Paint with the Soul was always an Alan tutorial ripoff. So there's a made-up show in the story called Paint with the Soul that plagiarized Alan Tutorial's video series. Now, the plagiarism was removed. The very obvious plagiarism, which was describing a literal episode of the show. So that was removed from this, and this is supposedly the original version that didn't plagiarize Alan Tutorial. Now, here's the problem, though. There is a thing in here... Uh, Paint with the Soul episode 10, if I could select it correctly. Boomer! Uh, and this is <laughs> this is the non-plagiarized original version of the story. It seems like they just deleted the most obvious plagiarism and left in other stuff that still is plagiarized but not as obviously. That is simply not true. To begin with, the dates just don't match. If we're to believe that the dates posted on the wiki version are accurate to when the story was being updated, then we can see that the first Paint with the Soul was posted in March of 2012. The video that Slime Beast claims it's ripping off, How to Do a Spanish Hair Braid, wasn't even posted until November of 2013. And not only that, Alan's tutorial itself only became very well known after May of 2012 when his famous video, How to Crush a Can of Dr. Pepper with Slats of Wood, was posted and became fairly popular. The first episode of Paint with the Soul is completely innocent as far as I'm concerned, and you can honestly tell that even from the context. In Paint with the Soul, the cameraman is mostly silent and simply picks up garbage and presents it to the camera before talking about how he wants to cleanse the world of garbage, that being humans. In Alan's tutorial, he's frantic, energetic, constantly dropping one thing only to pick it up again, 
and yet maintains a pleasant attitude throughout nearly the entire thing. Alan almost never comes across as misanthropic, even in the series as a whole, and even when he does talk about killing, it's when he's been personally wronged because he doesn't know how else to process what he's feeling. And there's very little evidence to suggest that he's hurt anyone on his own. Now, obviously, the omitted episodes of Paint with a Soul are totally guilty. They have Alan's tutorial written all over them. Not only are they now in a tutorial format, but the cameraman is now stuttering in a high voice, his hands are noticeably bloody, he's talking general nonsense, and it's two years after Alan's tutorial got put on the map. But let's remember, this is supposedly an addition made by the one who stole the story in the first place. How valid is that claim? Well, there's a lot of questions to ask and evidence to look over in order to come to a decent conclusion. So let's stack it all up. 1. We have to assume that 1999 went as a popular online story under the same name as his own for several years, with dozens of readings, with millions of views, all without Camden's notice. 2. Someone not only simply stole his work and re-uploaded it elsewhere, but also made their own additions to it, which is a lot of effort for something as low effort as stealing someone's story. 3. We are meant to assume that Camden only discovered his story was stolen very shortly after a relatively large scandal broke out over it regarding plagiarism, and the version we're to believe is his has no such stolen content. However, there's other things to consider that might go in Camden's favor. 1. In general, everything that was omitted from Camden's current version feels very much like filler. It's all extremely tacked on and adds very little to the story, even down to the fully new entry. Even some of the writing in these entries feels noticeably more simplistic. 2. If Camden really wanted to cover his tracks, why not say that Paint with the Soul in general was a fabrication from the story thief and remove the first entry? Booby shows up even earlier and that was omitted entirely. 3. Booby has no plagiarism connection. It's only based on another children's show that took place around the same time as his story and can easily be written off as homage or parody. There's no reason to omit it unless you didn't come up with the idea. You can easily say these were done intentionally, or maybe as the years went on, Camden found he just didn't like the booby subplot and elected to remove it from his new version. But the point is, we're missing a lot of information. Also, according to Slime Beast, the original author is an engineer, and the Creepypasta Wiki's user who uploaded the story was, of course, Giant Engineer. It's also worth noting that in both versions of the story, Elliot is also studying in college to be an engineer. That seems like a pretty big coincidence, but I don't think it's enough to sink him. Even Slime Beast himself says that it could very well be a coincidence. Maybe it's his TF2 main for all we know. We're going to need more evidence, and we have a couple things to look at. First, there's an interview the author did for a podcast back in March this year. I'll post a link to the blog post in the description. Curiously enough, I couldn't find the actual podcast mention, but I'm not sure if that's on me being bad at finding it, or if it just hasn't released yet. You can look for yourself if you want to, especially once this video is older. The interview is very informative on the actual story itself and gives us a good chunk of information, but if the author is lying, he's doing a good job at it. He doesn't slip up from his story once and claims that most readings of the story on YouTube had bogus fan-made material, though he curiously doesn't mention the fact that this fan-made material was plagiarized. He talks about an old show called All About Art that served as the inspiration for not only Mr. Bear's character, but also Paint with the Soul, though the two have quite different tones. At the end of the day, Paint with the Soul wasn't really about painting or art or anything like that, even the ones where it's ripping off Alan's tutorial. He mentions that the inspirations from the story came from 2005, not 1999, which could actually add up in terms of Booby's placement in the story, as Ubi aired until 2005. But that's a two-month window, and it's honestly kind of a stretch, but it's worth considering. Something else he mentions is that the stories beyond Mr. Bear Seller were written in as an afterthought, and even in the wiki version, that seems to be the case. Though again, this could easily be attributed to whoever took the story haphazardly throwing in random ideas. So the interview is definitely interesting, but there's nothing definitive that helps either case. We need to compare the two stories. After putting the two stories side by side and going over several agonizing details, I found two major hits. 
However, to add to the confusion, they both support opposite ends of the narrative. The first one I found was in the wiki version. In the line here, it says, His hand was booby, he was Mr. Bear, and he was the mysterious cameraman. Look at that capitalization. That is a classic amateur mistake for when you're adding something into something else that you've already written, which fits in exactly with Camden's claims. This reads as though someone just made up booby on the spot and stuck it in the story with no regard for how it fit in with anything else, even down to the sentence structure. Now, this is not a slam dunk, case closed situation for a couple of reasons. First of all, in his own interview, Camden claims that the stories beyond Mr. Bear Seller were afterthoughts, and this could easily apply to Booby as well, if he is Booby's creator. So somewhere during the writing process, he comes up with this idea for Booby, sticks it in an older draft, and makes a minor grammatical error along with it. Both this and the notion that someone else made a slip up while adding in their own super special 1999 OC are plausible. The second reason I don't think this vindicates him is that the second hit I found is potentially more damning. Both versions of 1999 have dates where the blog updates, but between versions they're very different. This is likely because on the wiki version, it was updating in real time on the dates listed, something that's impossible to prove now for both versions as neither are covered by the Wayback Machine. In the case of what I found, it's not what's different that makes the case, it's what's the same. In the scene where Elliot is confronting the kids as he's exploring the woods, in Camden's version, this entry takes place in 2010. In the wiki version, it takes place in 2012. And this seems like a very minor difference, but it absolutely matters. Because this line is the same between both versions. Did either of you hear of a guy who murdered a bunch of kids in these woods about 13 years ago? An accurate date for the wiki version, but not for Camden's. Now, it's possible he just made a mistake, but how unlikely is it that his inaccurate date would just so happen to line up with the date that it was updated on the wiki? And the guy's an engineer for God's sake. You expect me to believe he's bad at basic math? That's a mistake I would expect from me. I'm terrible at math, but even I noticed this. For a lot of what we looked over, there's some degree of plausible deniability on both sides of this argument. Duh, what a crock of middle of the word bullshit! This is the internet! We need answers! Where's the spicy hot take? Where's your conviction? This is not a criminal courtroom. I will not cast judgment without corroborating evidence and a decision from an impartial jury. He fucking did it. Like 70% sure. But the evidence just keeps stacking up in favor of the side that he's lying. That the wiki version was his all along down to the plagiarized content that he now attributes to his own fans. It's too much to assume that he never noticed his story was popular under the same name on a very popular horror story website. It's too much to assume that he only found out about this after a major scandal and all the coincidences and now the big damning piece of evidence here at the end just leads me to the idea that we're being deceived. And it sucks to have to say that because, honestly, I kind of like the story, despite its flaws and abrupt ending. It had good atmosphere, nice imagery, it wasn't nauseating despite being a story about a Satanist bear murdering over a dozen kids, it felt real, and I would have liked to see that sequel story he planned out. And hey, maybe we will get to see it. Camden said in his interview that he wants 1999 along with its prospective sequel to be adapted into live action, like what Channel Zero did with Candle Co. Yeah, I'll get back to looking at that one of these days. I certainly wouldn't mind seeing that, but really, if I am right on the money here and not just blowing the situation completely out of proportion, then I'd kind of just like to see Camden own up to it. Like, yeah dude, you were riding high on the relative success of your online story, you got cocky, and you made mistakes. These things happen. We all find inspiration in places that can easily turn into imitation without us even really thinking that's a bad thing. Hell, this whole channel started off as a blatant imitation of Mr. Plunkett. I like to think it's become its own thing now, though. 1999 is kind of the same way. The wiki version is honestly worse off than the one you can read now. Not just because of the Allen tutorial ripoffs, the booby entries feel tacked on and don't really add much of anything to the story. 
except gore where it isn't really needed. All they do is pad out the length when it's already long enough as it is. So in a weird way, the plagiarism scandal actually ended up giving us a better version of the story. I don't mind the current story being successful. If I am right, I'd just like Camden to admit his past mistakes. We're only people after all, and people at the end of the day are just garbage. Thanks for watching this video. I really hope it doesn't get a DMCA claim. It took a lot of fucking work to get it done. Thanks to all my patrons who were patient with me while I piled all this bullshit together. If you want to know my thought process while I make these videos, you can follow me on Twitter. And if you want to see me play video games in my spare time, check out my gaming channel at FasoisTF2. It's actually picked up a decent bit of traction lately, and I've got loads of ideas for it. That's it for me today. Until next time.